Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll begin the substance in a minute or so, but first I'd like to begin by sending uh, personally my heart out to, to Kazakhstan, to the people of Kazakhstan, especially the people who've suffered, uh, who've lost loved ones or who've been traumatized as I'm sure many, many, too many people have been by the recent upheavals. Um, today's event is an analytic event. We'll be trying to make sense of what happened and, and, and why, as you know, we've got a terrific panel. We've got at only an hour, terrific panelists. And we'll have the opportunity for um, some degree of, of Q&A after our discussion. So feel free to drop any questions that you have into the chat. Can't promise that we'll get to, uh, to absolutely everything, but we'll do our best to um, attend to the, the major themes that emerge from the, from the discussion and from the Q&A from, from the audience. Um, so let me begin myself with just a bit of background. It should be fairly familiar to folks, uh, though the, there's limited information, right? Um, information is always limited, but it's particularly limited in the context of a broad-based and national internet shutdown in, in Kazakhstan that's being restored and so on. And so information is coming back to us in dribs and drabs. But we'll get, we'll get more accounts, in fact, uh, as the days uh, and weeks um, uh, come on. But a few things are not in dispute. The upheavals in, in Kazakhstan began in the western part of the country. Um, the spark was rising fuel prices uh, for liquid petroleum gas, but this was really the tip of the iceberg. The, the region itself, um, that is to say the western part of the country had seen labor protests in the past. Um, the rest of Kazakhstan had seen uh, even national protests in 2016 and 2019, just to mention a couple of instances. By January the 4th, most cities in Kazakhstan witnessed mass mobilization against uh, poor economic prospects and elite corruption. And it was no longer uh, really about fuel prices, if it ever particularly was in the first place. Uh, in fact, the, the, the regime reversed course on the price of, of uh, this fuel and that didn't do anything to quell. Government buildings were seized and in some cities, security forces began to support the protesters, but in a, the major commercial capital, the largest, most influential city of Almaty, uh, looting and street fighting erupted. And details are, are, are sketchy on exactly why this happened, but the nature of the mobilization shifted clearly in Almaty when they took a more aggressive turn and security and police forces vanished for a time and, and uh, the rioters seemed to take uh, control of the streets for some time. Late on January the 5th, troops from the Russia-led Collective Security Treaty Organization arrived at the request of the embattled President Qasem Jomar Tokayev. Tokayev also is issued a, a shoot-to-kill order against protesters. Now, since then, things seem to have um, calmed down. Uh, there is talk as of this morning, at least Toronto time, so I'm not sure you know, what time it was in other parts of the world, of that the CSTO is going to withdraw the troops. Uh, I don't think there's a timeline for that. Uh, in any case, life in major cities is returning slowly um, back to normal, if normal is even possible. So we have a terrific panel to discuss these, and I want to turn to them as quickly as possible to discuss what happened in Kazakhstan, why it happened, and what the prospects are for Kazakhstan in the near future. We'll be chatting about the causes, the timing of the events, Russia's role in the region, and consequences, particularly for Kazakhstan, but for potentially beyond. I'm going to be giving each of our speakers eight minutes. I'm going to be somewhat ruthless because we have to um, we have to finish up within an hour, um, and uh, we'll have a discussant, um, Professor Lucan Wei, uh, give a comparative perspective. So first, I want to introduce our first speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Asel Tutumlu. She's assistant professor in the International Relations and Political Science Department at the Near East University in Northern Cyprus. Her fascinating, important research focuses on Central Asian authoritarian politics and regimes, and she's originally from Kazakhstan and focuses her research on Kazakhstan. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us, Asa. Thank you so much, Ed, and thank you so much, everyone, who, uh, who are joining us today. Um, so basically, I would start with the outlining the deeper, so to say, roots um, and the causes. Um, and obviously, besides the... Uh, 100% increase in uh, liquefied petroleum gas, uh, which is a vital commodity for pretty much most of the taxi drivers um, who roam the streets of Almaty and all kinds of other big cities in order to earn the living. 
Um, besides that, there were deeper causes. And among them, um, I think two are very important, uh, particularly that um, we had a kind of two-tier system um, operating uh, in which we had a very limited inner circle of the elites, which um, uh, pretty much controlled not only the assets, but controlled most of the economic um, uh, economically viable businesses, and not only. Um, and uh, they constantly expanded through uh, large affiliated companies uh, by channeling the rents from natural resources within themselves. Um, and then you have the other people who are not really part of the system, who were basically surviving. And uh, the World Bank, I think, calculated the uh, median salary range, um, which was indeed very close to the poverty line. So the, in these distinctions, I think the, the very strong inequality um, of these two very different systems um, presented obviously a, a huge frustration to many people. And so when the LPG prices were doubled, uh, many of the people who were outside just simply thought that now the, the type of social contract that existed before it now needs to be changed. Um, the regime, so to say, went way too far. Um, and then the second uh, uh, reason, I think, is obviously the, the fact that um, it was leaderless, right? For 30 years, uh, we haven't actually created institutions uh, that would enable some kind of participation, inclusivity in political decision-making process um, for some activists, elites, uh, among the elites and among the, 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 the regular people um, uh, to, to basically join and open up to create a more kind of pluralist uh, community. Um, and it was uh, interesting to see the um, grievances, uh, especially in the Western part uh, of the country, and I think Darmen is going to talk more about it, that particularly aimed at uh, creating some kind of institutions of local participation, municipality elections, um, changes and elections of the Akims, right? So people didn't really want to see the whole system change initially. They actually just wanted to have a voice um, to enhance their standards of living within the community they were living in. Uh, and obviously um, it was just part of the pro uh, protesters. Some other protesters had uh, a, a kind of more political aim, um, like changing, for example, the uh, uh, the entire constitutional order uh, from presidential to um, to parliamentary republic. Uh, but in general, the claims were that, that they just wanted to have a voice in the municipal and local um, uh, institutions. Um, and uh, um, uh, they were widespread, particularly, again, uh, because I think the, the LPG was kind of very symbolic. Um, the LPG prices. Um, initially, most of the protesters who came on the street were really regular people. And you could tell that they probably didn't go on the street before, uh, the way they were dressed, they were, they were speaking. They were just regular, especially in Almaty. Um, the people who joined them were these taxi drivers who also just simply thought solidarity and sympathy um, uh, for, for you know, Zien, um where the drivers, uh, where most of the people came out to voice their grievances. Um, in Almaty, the uh, protests were a bit different, obviously, because of not only the size of the city, but also the uh, different groups that participated in the protests. Among them, we can see um, uh, people who simply were sympathizers who came out. Um, you can see more um, organized political movements. Uh, with various agendas, uh, liberal, nationalists. Uh, um, so different, uh, different people coalesced around the idea that I think this two-tier system, or at least inequality, um, had to be reverted and, in, uh, uh, um, and changed in some way or another. Um, in terms of timing, um, I think the uh, uh, people who watch the protest, uh, protests in Kazakhstan uh, can see that they have been spiking <laughs> at a kind of irregularity, if you, uh, especially if you take the COVID away, um, then uh, many people now tend to analyze it as a, as a kind of a one ongoing boiling um, activity uh, and activism. Um, and the timing was simply that um, people just felt dismayed. Uh, and that, uh, that is the reason why they, they poured so much on the street. Um, in an attempt to basically voice, finally have a voice um, uh, of their opinion. 
um, without fear, without uh, you know a sen a censorship. They just wanted to say that uh, this is not th th this type of contract. They are not really um, in agreement with. Um, and uh, the the reason why Almaty was different, I think it's um, it's because of the different groups. And also, we don't necessarily have the whole information to understand uh, who were the uh, uh, bandits that came out, uh, what exactly, um, uh, you, know, you know, what exactly, um, first of all, not only what they did, we kind of know what they did, but which of these movements were engaged, for example, in uh, uh, looting, which of them were engaged in violence and shooting, which of them were engaged in taking up the the government buildings and setting them on fire. So there, there's a lot of really gap, real gaps that we are not really sure um, who exactly was on the street. Um, from personal accounts of my friends, um, uh, people who were, uh, for example, uh, trying to stop the cars uh, were actually um, speaking Kazakh to them. So uh, that that's kind of puts an irony into the uh, regime's narrative today um, that they were foreign, foreign trade terrorists. Um, although there are some accounts that uh, um, uh, some of these bandits were asking, for example, they were not really sure um, with the geography of Almaty. So they were asking, where is this particular building or how do I get to that building? Um, so obviously there's a lot of this eyewitness account and anecdotal evidence that we are operating with without really seeing the, 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 the whole picture yet. Um, for the uh, CSTO, um, there are two possible reasons why CSTO was invited. Um, so one of them uh, is basically uh, basically implies that Tokayev, and that was my initial um, reaction um, or interpretation, um, that Tokayev was simply afraid of uh, the repeat of Zhenaozen uh, in 2011, where government uh, opened fire. Well, we government still openly didn't acknowledge that it was them who opened fire, but um, obviously the, the uh, 16 people um, died, um, peaceful protesters died at that time. Uh, and I think it was such a, it left such a big stain um, uh, so that's why the, the government didn't want to shoot the, the protesters uh, in mass, especially since Almaty is so big. Um, uh, uh, so that, that was my initial reason. So inviting CSTO uh, was a way to go. Um, so you kind of clean up using somebody else's hands, uh, making somebody else's hands dirty. But at the same time, uh, with all the violence that occurred on the night of January 5th, there is a possibility to think that maybe Tokayev didn't really have um, a reliable uh, army to, to, to deal with. And that's simply because, um, according to, uh, to, to the information um, of, uh, available in the media, um, somebody gave orders uh, right, to leave airport, for example, half an hour before an attack. Uh, somebody gave orders so that there were absolutely no police, um, no one, no, no law enforcement, not even the fire department or the, the ambulances were actually uh, working and responding to the calls. So, so that's, so, so who gave these orders um, and uh, why exactly that happened that the city was completely left uh, for looters, uh, bandits and so on. Um, on its own for, for about a day and a half, that's still we are we are not very sure about. Um, and so there is a possibility to think that Tokayev in these circumstances maybe thought that um, since the law enforcement bodies are not under his personal control, that maybe it's time to call to, to, to call in international troops. Um, and then uh, just um, uh, in terms of the consequences, um, just to comment on the consequences for society, obviously we are seeing this uh, already that um, the government is arresting people in mass, um, and they are really hastily creating a narrative in which they're trying to find people and accuse uh, external, so to say, enemies so far to accuse them in in all kinds of um, uh, in all kinds of uh, things uh, uh, without proper investigation. Um, so, so for society, it's not really good. But uh, without the reforms, I think there would still be. Uh, this collective action, leaderless or not, uh, but we are going to see it periodically um, in the future. For the regime, um, having the CSTO troops uh, obviously means that uh, the, the regime would be more reliant 
on, uh, on uh, Russia. I'm not sure that this would be the end of the multi-vector policy. I, I think that we can still, um, so to say, um, maneuver. <laughs> and, and I think uh, I'm very much um, sympathetic in, uh, in, uh, with Tokayev in, in, in his skill, so to say, uh, to maintain some kind of uh, uh, a balance, uh, even if it may be tilted more towards Russia um, in the near future. And for Central Asia uh, as a total, uh, in, in general, I think uh, a lot of people um, who had the aspirations for political change now can see that it may be actually very deadly and maybe uh, not necessarily viable in the near future to go against the regimes because of, of this uh, external um, threat that may come out um, under the banner of, so to say, the peacekeeping forces. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Asaya. That was that was terrific. It put a lot of things on the table and um, we'll we'll have a chance to discuss many, though, as I promised, not all of the um, of the things that you uh, that you that you bring up. Um, now let's turn to uh, Darman Kok. Um, Darman is a research assistant at the University of Toronto. He holds an MA in European Russian Affairs uh, from U of T and an MA in International Relations from Kimep University in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, in fact, for his final research paper at U of T, he focused on power transitions in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and which seems to be an important uh, component, at least, of the story that we're seeing unfold here. Um, Darman, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Schatz. Uh, thank you for having me. So, um, as Dr. Schatz mentioned, uh, so my discussion will be more about the elite dynamics, right? So, because my paper was on power transitions, uh, but with the little disclaimer, of course, because it, it is hard to know what's going on behind the scenes and the situation is still unfolding and there is no stable con internet connection uh, on the ground still in some places, uh, but I think one way uh, to look at it is that the socioeconomic grievances of people led to massive protests that intensified the elite struggle for power, culminating in the city of Palmari. So there is a widespread agreement now is um, among the regional expert community and journalists that the violence is partly can be a result of failed managed power transition attempt from former President Nazarbayev to uh, President Tokayev that started uh, in 2019 uh, with Nazarbayev's official resignation. Uh, because ex-President Nazarbayev and his inner circle still retained uh, considerable influence in the country, including over the security apparatus, uh, it, it created a situation where in Kazakhstan, there was basically two power centers which uh, you know, Dr. Hale um, termed as the you know, two pyramid system or competing pyramid system. So um, as a result, uh, those who've been you know, uh, observing what's going on and the elite uh, dynamics and transition of Ka in Kazakhstan um, can, was able to see that kind of President Tokayev uh, has been trying to slowly consolidate his power while dealing with the pre-existing balance of power and formal mechanisms to control him. Like, although there has been little evidence uh, of tensions between him and Nazarbayev personally, there had been frictions between President Tokayev's administration and uh, those associated with the former president's group. In addition, um, Tokayev expressed on multiple occasions that his orders are being sabotaged and there are people within the government uh, that hamper his reforms. But it seems like right before the protests, uh, the power configuration was already you know, shifting towards the Tokayev. And during this um, transition period, he had some opportunities to consolidate his power, but um, it's very you know, extremely um, critical situations. Like there was uh, explosions in the am ammunition depots in Kazakhstan, which allowed him to Change the Minister of Defense, and there was also, uh, you know, this crisis associated with the COVID-19, which also allowed to, you know, take control over some, you know, uh, aspects of policy making. And uh, the, I think the situation might have prompted the elites who were dissatisfied with the transition results to fight back. And the recent events, in, in like, indicate that there is indeed 
intense elite confrontation on the backdrop of public protests, including the arrest of the Masim of the head of the National Security Committee on treason charges. There has been already multiple confirmed deaths of uh, high-level law enforcement officials, uh, as well as uh, President Tokayev replacing Nazarbayev in the role of the head of the Security Council with the accompanying uh, staffing changes in the security apparatus. And I think in this vein, it is also possible to um, explain the invitation of the CSTO forces. And that can, I think, at least um, given this political environment, mean at least three, three things, right? So first, I think President Tokayev became convinced that domestic security forces were not loyal to him. Second is to signal uh, that the elites uh, that he has the backing of the signal to the elites that he has the backing of the major power. Um, so to create this urgency to among the elites to kind of reorient themselves around Tokayev. Um, and also, finally, probably he was trying to prevent the escalation of violence by inviting an external actor to enforce mutual agreement within the elites. Uh, of course, it's one of the many explanations, and it is the it's extremely complex situation. And I think it should not, of course, downgrade the you know the legitimate socioeconomic grievances that people have, and uh, with the widespread corruption and you know low income and overall distrust towards the government. So, but my take is and my look at it is through this elite dynamics and this perspective. Terrific. Thank, thank you, Dharmit. And I think it, you know, nice, nice reminder there that as analysts, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can talk about this as, you know, there's an elite dynamic issue and there is a, you know, there are socioeconomic grievances uh, at play. And which one we talk about depends upon, you know, questions we're asking. But both of those are clearly at play in, in uh, over the past week, uh, uh, at least in, in Kazakhstan. Okay, thanks so much, Darman. Um, for that analysis. Finally, um, let's turn to um, Dr. Asel Dol Dolotkardieva. Um, Asel is our second Asel, uh, is senior lecturer at the OSCE Academy, and she comes to us from Bishkek, uh, Kyrgyzstan, where they do have stable internet. Um, Asel is writing a fascinating book on protests and contentious politics in Eurasia, and she's done some work uh, particularly on Kazakhstan, although she herself is from is from Kyrgyzstan and does work in Kyrgyzstan uh, as well. So thanks for joining us as well. Uh, oh, sorry, we need uh, we need you to unmute. Thanks. So many zooms and still don't know how to do this function. So sorry. So um, thank you very much for organizing this uh, terrific event. And as my colleagues already actually highlighted many aspects of um, this very complex um, uh, event, I think um, what I will do is to discuss them a little bit from the perspective of um, mobilization and um, um, social movement literature. So we have um, here um, in Kazakhstan quite a complex picture, picture of uh, protest dynamics. So we have on one hand local protests, uh, on the other hand I think what can be called actually already at this point as popular uprisings and elite struggle uh, with um, some elements of criminal in involvement. So um, this means that we had professional strikes in industrial towns, uh, but also popular uprising in Almaty, which included urban residents, political activists, but also uh, the working class from the suburbs. Very interestingly, Astana, which shares uh, some of these features with Almaty, uh, was much more stable um, and it did not have the involvement of many internal um, labor uh, migrants. Uh, but also we had the concentration of looting and violence in the South, which probably coincides with the concentration of economic assets and elites there. So each of these uh, important points deserve a special discussion, but I can only pay a token attention to space, time, and grievances, uh, because I think this is um, very important not to lose sight of uh, once we are shifting um, our attention to the elite struggle by using some of the theories in mobilization uh, literature. So um, I would like to share a couple of uh, graphs, if I may, um, with from a research project that I conducted together with my colleague uh, from AUCA, Medet Tuligenov. Uh, we are doing a comparative research on a contentious politics in uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and uh, lately uh, Georgia. So very quickly, let me see here it is. 
Um, could you please um, nod your head, Ed, if you can see this? Yeah, great. So um, I would like to start with grievances. Um, my colleagues already uh, highlighted that these uh, grievances and demands that were uh, um, uh, promoted by uh, peaceful protesters are long-term and structural. So from this um, very simple graph, you can see that the number of protests uh, in Kazakhstan have been rising, specifically starting from 2008, 2009. So what we have today um, is nothing new, really. Um, myself, when I was in Kazakhstan for a research trip uh, just um, at the end of November, and I was talking to workers and other people in Karaganda, so a lot of people were really angry and frustrated, and they were um, uh, talking about uh, social inequalities, uh, they were um, saying that they are the polarization of society in terms of wealth is increasing and that there is basically um, they cannot anymore um, wait with uh, Nazarbayev, that the elites have to be out. Yeah, so there was this very palpable anger that has accumulated for years and it was expressed through art, music, folk, um, uh, literature, uh, which was already um, actually written by Kazakhstani um, uh, experts. So, um, yeah, um, my second uh, slide just shows uh, that um, this uh, protest um, in Kazakhstan have been um, um, present um, in the past years and they've been ev evolving around those, um, what is called socioeconomic issues such as land, housing, um, but also pensions, labor conflict, um, and uh, financial loans, right? So um, these uh, socioeconomic demands are by no means new to Kazakhstan. The problem is that our um, um, journalistic and scholarly framing of the socioeconomic issues, because I think actually they are narrowly framed as socioeconomic by, but by definition they are deeply political because this protest which demands socioeconomic um, issues, um, they are actually about social democracy because this is about the redistribution of wealth with Within society and uh, protesters demanding to uh, reformulate the state society relations and redistribute benefits in a much more fair way. So uh, by all means, I, I see that not narrowly as socioeconomic, but actually as a um, uh, deeply political at the core. So um, I would like to move next to the point to the issue of space because this is something that we um, identified in our research. Uh, the upper, um this, the upper image is a Danish protest and below is about um, Kyrgyzstan uh, protest. And it, it, you can see in this um, upper image um, that uh, protests uh, in Kazakhstan have been really dispersed through uh, space, through the vast territory of Kazakhstan. And it's um, been always an issue um, whether the protests will be able to coordinate among themselves across such a huge space. Whereas in Kyrgyzstan, of course, the majority of protests take place in the capital because it's the, uh, Supposed, it's considered as the site of power and politics where all the uh, disobedience and rebellion should take place. So there is a huge uh, difference. But once again, this uh, upper image shows, this confirms once again what we had in the last uh, week that uh, most of the protests in Kazakhstan are dispersed across uh, space and do not take uh, place in only one place, but are um, in uh, different uh, towns. The question is, uh, which we didn't touch upon in this research, but uh, this should be coming now, is basically about how these different um, isolated places, how coll collective um, uh, political subjectivities and collective action is um, uh, created and structured in different um, uh, geographical places. If in the Western Kazakhstan, we saw that collective action was stru uh, structured around the uh, industrial sectors and relied heavily on the informal uh, workers' collectivities. Um, in Almaty, it was uh, mainly leaderless and um, uh, the um, uh, spontaneous and lacked coherence and uh, structure. 
We know from the, some of the witnesses and um, video accounts that uh, some of the public figures uh, tried to take a, a leading role, but uh, they were unsuccessful. And of course, we can um, blame the authoritarian politics for that, for destroying basically any alternative forces, uh, and therefore, the, which cannot uh, take um, the lead in uh, such um, public actions as a protests. Just to show uh, here that the, um, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> just a second. Mm. And this next graph is about the duration of our protest events. Again, a comparison between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And as you can see, uh, both countries actually uh, share quite similar dynamics in the lens uh, of the protest. Most of them don't uh, last more than uh, 10 days, actually. And this is, of course, due to not only repressive environment in which protests have to operate, but also to uh, the very meager infrastructure of collective action uh, available to protest, such as resources, human resources, financial resources to sustain any uh, collective public um, action. So uh, this is, I think, very important for all um, uh, listeners um, and watchers in, in the West who um, try to understand the peculiarities of uh, collective action in uh, Central Asia, because unlike uh, Western social movements, we do not have the, um, the possibilities and resources to sustain our uh, protest in, um, in such an environment. Um, I think uh, that's it for the graphs. Um, let me return to uh, my main point. So, um, um, yeah, um, okay, just one final thing. Um, uh, I think we really need to pay attention to, um, uh, to the ordinary um, uh, protesters and their political subjectivities, um, the sources of those political subjectivities, how they are formed, and the political consciousness of these um, citizens. So what's going on right now, there are um, uh, kind of ongoing competing narrative of what exactly happened in Kazakhstan and different actors compete uh, to uh, impose the epistemic hegemony on what happened and narrate the story. In this uh, story making, in this sense making, there is one group of population, very important one, which we can call the working class or the precariat uh, in the, the suburbs of Almaty, which is now being silenced because they do not kind of fit this uh, shiny glitter image of modernity and uh, capitalism and do not kind of as if they are not the true um, uh, bearers of political consciences uh, compared to the uh, urban uh, activists um, and the like. Although they are very active, they've been very active in this uprising, both in um, uh, peaceful and uh, um, violent protest and it's very um, interesting there are very few interviews available with uh, these um, protesters and they what they say is extremely political it they show that simply they are very high political consciousness because they talk about um, uh, the inability to exercise their citizenship because access to health education uh, many other public goods is denied to them and this is uh, enough is enough and uh, that uh, this regime should should be out so so um, we must not to discard these subjectivities, but to include into our analysis and make our scholarly analysis uh, much more uh, inclusive of all these diverse struggles. S thank you. Sorry for being. No, that's a that's a terrific uh, note to end on. Yes, let's uh, you know silent applause uh, from everybody um, because this <laughs> you know as we scholars and, and others make sense of these events, right? They're very complicated on the ground. They're always complicated. And, and especially in the context where there is a, a regime that is keen on controlling the narrative, um, it's important to do our best to try to hear this diversity and to build it into um, our accounts of, of these events. Um, not to mention any kind of normative or moral reason to do so, but uh, even just for pure, purely analytic reasons, uh, it's, it's important to keep track of this diversity. Um, just quickly before I turn to our discussant, um, just a reminder, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. You're welcome to drop any questions in, in there. If, if your question is best directed to somebody in particular, feel free to mention it. Um, let's turn to Professor uh, Lucan Wei, who's Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And I'll just mention one, uh, the most recent of Lucan's uh, books, which is coming out with I think it's coming out, right, Lucan, at Princeton University Press, Social Revolution and Authoritarian Durability in the Modern World. Lucan is both uh, an expert on former Soviet space and a, a comparativist in a, in, in a true sense of the term. And so I think 
think the book will be uh, quite global in scope, if I'm not mistaken, right, Lucan? So a little bit more of a comparative perspective. Lucan. Um, thanks. And uh, the only reason why Ed in invited me was because we go back, you know, informal ties back many years. So I appreciate it because I, you know, don't know any very much about Kazakhstan at all. Um, at the same time, you know, I mean, it's, it's been a wonderful discussion. I, I think the thing from a comparative perspective that strikes me about what's going on in Kazakhstan is basically that from a comparative perspective, the protests don't seem to have been that threatening to the uh, regime. Um, I mean, it's as, you know, uh, it's actually quite hard and very rare for, for mass protests to overthrow a government, especially one as well-funded um, as, as the Kazakh state was. I mean, this is, this is not Kyrgyzstan in 2005 or Georgia in 2003, where you had significant wage arrears. You know, this, these were, in those cases, very weak states. By any measure, Kazakhstan was quite a strong state. Um, and in general, I mean, the work of Milan Svolik has, has showed us, you know, across the board that, you know, autocratic breakdowns due to mass protests is, are, you know, about 11% of autocratic breakdowns are due to mass protests. So it's a very rare event to begin with. And, and what's striking also is, you know, so the, the, the extent to which how rapidly um, Tokayev sort of did acts that at least to the outsider appears quite desperate, you know, first making a major concession in terms of firing Nazarbayev and even more striking of bringing in foreign troops, um, you know, bringing in foreign troops to save your power in the post-Cold War era has been extremely rare. I can think of about three or four instances, uh, Gabon in 1990 when um, they brought in, Bongo brought in uh, French troops, uh, you know, obviously in Bahrain, um, in 2011, Syria in 2011, but in both, the, the, in both Syria and Bahrain, you know, the situation was much more dire for the incumbent than it appeared to be in Kazakhstan. I mean, you know, in Bahrain, the protests have been going on with hundreds of thousands of people for over a month before they brought in Saudi troops. Here you have about thousands or tens of thousands leaderless protests and they bring in sort of almost immediately you know, troops. And so all of this sort of suggests that while both, you know, there's obviously both a sort of bottom up perspective and a top down perspective. I, I agree with Ed. This seems, it seems like the action probably lies in the elite perspective that it suggests that there's a real sort of a Tokayev, you know, was facing real internal threats. And it really feels, I sort of, you know, think of the phrase from the, uh, from the Cold War of like, you know, of Sovietologists talking about sort of, you know, trying to interpret a, bulldog fight under a rug <laughs> you're sort of seeing these you have basically we just don't know what's really going on but it, it, there's clearly some sort of elite battle going on I, and i guess i i would sort of put less emphasis on uh the sort of the scale of the protests or the um and more on the sort of the elite conflict that's it how is that for brevity ed admirable striking almost surprising thank you <laughs> <laughs> we do go way back. Um, thanks, Luke. And, and you know, uh, the, I'm sure the book will go into a lot more detail on uh, the different cases that 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 uh, Professor Wei um, offers us. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes. It's okay, I think, if we go a little bit over. Although um, folks in Bishkek are heroically uh, showing up at near midnight here, so we don't want to push it uh, too very far. Um, I think what I'd like to do, in addition to you know Lucan's considerations, let me throw out two quick things. And, um, and anyone on the panel, any one of our speakers who wants to consider it, please do. And then we'll turn to um, questions from the, uh, from the chat. Um, I, guess the, I guess I have a question for, um, maybe it's mostly for Darman, or at least it's spurred by Darman's thinking and maybe what some of the things that, that Lucan is offering, but I, you know, it's open to anybody. And that is this, like how, so Tokayev has clearly made a bunch of moves to try to distance himself from his mentor, right? Um, what's the likelihood that that's going to work, um, either for the elite itself, or if you think that this matters, and it, maybe it doesn't, um, but uh, if you think this matters, for the general population, is Tokayev, is there any world in which Tokayev can rehabilitate himself if it's true that Nazarbayev has become, you know, um, disgraced in the eyes of much of the general, the general public? So, 
that's a question which seems to me to be pretty important um, uh, when we think about the competition in, in the elite right now and its, and its significance. Um, and then the second question is, um, and it, it, come, it sort of riffs on some of the things that are coming through the chat, and it has to do with how do we study this stuff, right? Um, like, you know, especially in real time. Um, where are we getting our information from? Somebody asked, you know, there, there was an internet, um, uh, the, and I mentioned at the beginning, the internet was more or less shut down. So how are we getting information? How do we know who to believe? And especially as the various spin doctors start to do their, their magic going forward, um, what's, what's the role for, um, for, you know, observers generally speaking, or maybe scholars in particular in trying to interpret events? And, and, and how, you know, given, if you were to design a sort of research project on this, um, aside from getting under that rug that, you know, where the bulldogs are fighting, which might be a little hard, like what would be, what would be the sort of a research strategy? That may be a big question. Well, um, opening those two things up to um, anyone on the panel and um, why don't we just go around and if you have anything to, to add um, on any, any of the themes that are sort of in the air, uh, go ahead. Should we start in the same order, Dr. Tutumlu? All right, thank you One so much. Minutes, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so there is still very much uh, unknown, right? Uh, um, and the fact that Tokayev has been distancing himself from Nazarbayev doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're, so to say, not together, or that uh, there is somehow the relationship is broken. Um, instead, uh, it may be used simply to pacify the, the people um, who basically see the um, existing system as uh, belonging to Nazarbayev. Um, so the, the most prominent uh, slogan of the movement was uh, Shalket, uh, like just uh, go away the old man, so to say. Um, so uh, yeah, so he may be distancing himself just uh, for, um, for specific reasons in order to, uh, to basically protect him. Um, and uh, whether or not this is the case, we are going to see um, uh, a bit later uh, when he first creates the, the um, government. Um, I think the, the promise was uh, to establish it by January 19th. Um, and then also whether or not the assets will still remain within the Nazarbayev's family. I think this is very important because uh, that's, that will tell us if indeed uh, uh, Tokayev uh, went against, so to say, his mentor or just simply trying to cover up um, uh, and create some kind of uh, stability for the existing regime. Um, in terms of the research strategy, um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to do it, uh, not only in the authoritarian context, uh, but also when um, you don't really have the complete information. Um, so um, we, we can do the... Um, ethnographies of, uh, of the Western, so to say, or not only Western, but uh, foreign uh, views and interpretations, uh, particularly how fast uh, uh, people started to talk about uh, Russia and China um, in these events uh, without necessarily, as I say, pointed out, uh, looking at, at the whole um, reason for the protest, uh, which were actually the poor people who were very much dissatisfied with the existing regime. Um, so we can do the ethnography. So for, for me, what worked um, is that I was able to use uh, uh, paid Skype and, and uh, call the landlines uh, during the whole time. Uh, so that, that actually um, worked quite well. Um, so, but again, for that, you need to know uh, the, the phone numbers of, of your informants, obviously, not just the mobile, but, uh, but the landlines. Um, so... I don't really have a specific uh, research strategy, actually. Um, I think before we can create this type of uh, kind of past interpretations, um, we should uh, make sure that we, we have a kind of a pretext to say that it's all speculation at this point <laughs> and then go from there. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, Darman. Yeah, uh, I'll take the first question. Um, and I just want to uh, point out here that actually Tokayev publicly verbally distanced himself from Nazarbayev, right? It never happened. He didn't identify him as standing behind this perpetrator, so whatever. And this is nothing like what happened between, uh, you know, Atambayev and Jim Bekov in Kyrgyzstan, where they started throwing like verbal bombs at each other, like from the beginning. And I think, uh, Part of the reason for that is that because Nazarbayev's name carries a huge symbolic power, 
and uh, Kazakhstan is like it's a newly independent country and uh, Tokayev said multiple times that it's important to keep his legacy you know for strengthening our statehood and for you know overall nation building narrative that Kazakhstan has and attacking him will be attacking also the elite that was with him for so many years so I think um, the the president will Tokayev will try to avoid that as much as possible. Maybe he will try to build bridges and make reforms first uh, before trying to kind of push everything, all bad things onto Nazarbayev. So I think he's very careful in doing that. And as we see how developments are going, for instance, the Karim Asimov who was arrested on January 6th and public got to know about that only on January 8th. So there is this big gaps going on. I think the regime is not hurrying up in, you know, making some bold statements about these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have a following question on that. Um, um, Dr. Dolot Kaldiva. Um, there are so many conspiracy theories going on right now inside Kazakhstan, right? And depending where citizens um, in I mean, where in which to which class citizens belong and where they have worked previously, whether it's in state corporations or the government or local academies, they would have very different versions. So that on, according to one version that Tokayev tried to unseat Nazarbayev, according to the other versions that Nazarbayev tried to unseat, and Nazarbayev's clan tried to unseat Tokayev and so on and so forth. So uh, for me, this is really um, kind of, the, it's not a ground to now kind of speculate into this. I think what we need to pay attention is that tomorrow there are going to be a new appointments in the government. And I say um, rightly pointed that uh, we would need to look at this new government and this will tell quite a lot. And second of all, uh, for me, what it was worrying is the deaths of two chief commanders of um, their um, enforcement bodies, um, uh, right? One in the south and one in Nur Sultan. And uh, the chief commander who um, died in Nur Sultan is said to be um, a Masimov's uh, man. So I think uh, what's going to be happening now in the in the law enforcement bodies will also tell us what's uh, going on. Is it just the, the, the head that of the structure that has changed or the entire structure of uh, police and um, special uh, security forces is being, you know, under complete reform. Um, yeah, um, I think your point about um, how do we do research in such um, places, right, and in such um, turmoil and time um, is, a, is a great question. Um, and um, somebody who comes from a place where there were three revolutions, <laughs> I can share some insights with you. <laughs> Um, you know, what's str striking is that when I was in Kazakhstan a month ago and I was talking to my uh, colleagues, local colleagues, nobody saw this coming. And I had even an argument with a colleague who said that the poverty is reduced to 9%. So if we rely on, on statistics, this will not tell us what's really going on in terms of mood, uh, society, mobility, and the developments within the social fabric, right? So ethnography is, um, um, for me, what's really worked well uh, during such turmoil is running around, well, of course, not in, during, amid such violence, uh, but in Kyrgyzstan, I was running in rallies um, and simply trying to interview as many um, uh, ordinary participants as possible, try to get them their stories try to understand um, uh, their lives um, and th this way to reconstruct um, their political subjectivities, the reasons of their protesting and, and so on and so forth. It's an extremely energy and time consuming uh, endeavor. Uh, that necessitates um, actually teams of scholars working on them. So um, that's, I mean, a huge work is awaiting for us in terms of now uh, reconstructing what has happened in Kazakhstan. Yeah, no, that's uh, that that's a terrific reminder that, um, you know, shout out to people who are doing intensive field work, ethnographic in, in particular, but more generally intensive field work um, across the region and who have a good pulse on on, on what's happening. Um, let me try to blend a couple of questions partially from the chat and uh, Lucan, did you want to chime in? Briefly? Yeah, so I just wanted to say quickly that I do that. You know, obviously we don't know, we don't have know what's, you know, actually what's going on. We don't know the bulldogs, but I will say that what's going on is consistent at least with Takayev's actions being explained by an effort to preempt or thwart a coup attempt. If you look at historically 
um, you know, mass uprisings and riots and unrest have very frequently been used as an excuse by the military to intervene in politics. Um, and given reports that Zakayev doesn't control many of the security services, his sort of actions, you know, to me, the most likely explanation is that he was trying to thwart a military coup. And that would at least be consistent with a lot of other kind of historical cases. So, okay. No, no, I think that's an important thing. And if you're trying to explain the violent turn sort of towards the end of this week, right? Um, or middle of this week, wherever we are now, because the beginning story was, was not about that. Maybe it provided an opening for the elite battle that we're, uh, that we're now talking about. I do wanna ask, and um, return to the question of revolution, because maybe this is a way to tie some of these things together. Um, what, you know, I, we don't need to dive down, you know, into some, a semantic uh, debate, uh, you know, a rabbit hole about um, about whether the the word is appropriate. But, you know, I mean, you've experienced three revolutions. I don't know if you want to put them in in scare quotes or not. Uh, I said, but um, it 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 relates to this question: What do we expect? And maybe this is a question of what we see in the cabinet. We'll get some initially um, some initial indications, but. Do we expect the regime to tighten the screws on the opposition or on figures within the elite? Uh, do we expect the regime to make good on some kind of socio uh, reform platform that's broadly substantive? Uh, because we know there have been promises um, uh, made in the past and in, in 2011 in the aftermath of Jean and they promised lots of things for the for the region, and it's not clear to me how much of that actually materialized. So. What do we expect, or could we expect both? Can you both tighten the screws and embark on an ambitious plan of socioeconomic reform so that you, um, you know, and this gets to a second question, which is, to me, they're linked, but which is about Russia, right? Um, you know, Russia has indicated, I think this morning, Putin indicated that, uh, that the troops will, will leave soon. I, th I don't think there's a timetable for that. Uh, and, you know, soon can mean lots of things, but in any case, uh, uh, taking that at face value, um, what is Russia's shadow that's cast across Kazakhstani politics and its, and its political development going forward? I mean, any kind of, uh, high, or is, or would Russia, because we, we don't have to assume, t you know, the, the worst of intents here uh, necessarily, is it possible that Russia would let political development go its own natural organic course within Kazakhstan, or does it want to have its fingers inside uh, the uh, the pie in Kazakhstan. Anyway, cluster of questions there. Who wants to who wants to jump in? Dr. Tutumlu, you want to start? All right, I will start. Thank okay. you so much. Um, so I think what we can expect is both, actually. Um, there will be definitely tightening the screws on political opposition or any particular opposition, um, because the regime now needs uh, some faces uh, to create a narrative. Um, uh, in a way that uh, they were indeed foreign trained uh, terrorists um, and there were 20,000 of them. Um, and so as a result, we get, for example, the, the famous uh, Kyrgyz jazz musician who is now accused and on camera basically confessing that yes, it was him who participated and joined the protests for $200. Um, so, so, so things like that, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so the screws will be tied. Uh, but at the same time, the regime knows that um, the, the bulk of the people who came out also need some type of concessions. So I'm expecting to see um, a relatively populist um, set of measures, mostly economic. Uh, and among them, I think there was a question in the chat at the beginning um, from Elias Madiarov, uh, or I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but uh, um, the, the basically um, a lot of people, a lot of these people uh, who came on the streets uh, have loans um, uh, to the banks that are controlled by the elite or the inner circle. Um, and so as a result, the government, uh, uh, Tokayev would have to uh, create some kind of measures either to forget uh, the loans as he did before uh, to people who are in dire conditions um, or at least adopt the, the personal bankruptcy law, which was delayed for quite a long time and didn't allow people to actually uh, simply walk away from, from, from these uh, loans that they had to pay. Uh, and now probably I'm also thinking that uh, they would have to adopt the law. He already, I think, promised uh, uh, to look into that. Uh, the, the only thing is that uh, the initial measures that were promoted um, to support the, the people were very much superficial. Uh, and I think the second uh, um, set of uh, reforms that he promised to, to adopt, uh, 
or it was kind of carefully framed um, and not to adopt, but to, to, to look into, I guess, or that was a particular, there was a particular wording um, would involve uh, the set of populist measures um, so just to quell the, the level of, of grievances. Um, and this has been going on with protests for quite a long time. We can see that when mothers with multiple children come out, uh, somehow their problems get solved. Uh, and then the government comes up with a different uh, state program. Uh, then, for example, uh, somebody else comes out with economic grievances and government tries to solve it. So we didn't really expect that the, the protests will be that violent. Um, so obviously there is, uh, there, there is a lot to speculate who were these violent people on the on the streets and why there was no real protection in the police. Um, in terms of Russia, um, uh, I also think that Russia will not necessarily stay. Um, uh, for Russia, uh, this particular this case is a showcase uh, uh, to all other protesters uh, in Central Asia to say that uh, it reminds me of a quadruple alliance kind of uh, to safeguard this uh, monarchic order. <laughs> you know, like we are going to stand for 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 that particular order, um, and uh, they will. Um, I'm not sure how successful, but uh, in terms of uh, the, the Kazakhstani, um, Kazakhstan being losing the sovereignty or being under the Russian grip, um, there will be some concessions, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, Russia will uh, try to, to establish some kind of um, deep state inside Kazakhstan. Um, I think it's very much it's very much easier to govern with people who personally owe you something and therefore you can always negotiate. So I, I don't necessarily see Kazakhstan losing uh, or the sovereignty to the point where you be, we become puppet states. Okay, yeah, no, fair. I mean, on the first point, one might ask, you know, whether this sort of re react, this sort of reactive uh, posture, react, this pattern of reactive policy making, right? Something bad happens, now then we do concessions. I mean, uh, it seems to me that you know, meaningful uh, political reform, even if it falls well short of you know a full scale democratization, um, might help to um, make policy making a little bit less reactive um, and a little bit more proactive. Um, Darman or Assad. Just a few remarks, I think, uh, in regards uh, to the first question, two things I think will be very telling of uh, the future trajectory. First is how the justice will be served, uh, to what extent, you know, the government will be transparent about what happens. So that can be telling about whether government is going to make some cosmetic changes or it will be something more like profound. And the second, I agree with uh, Dr. Dole Kildiva that the composition of the future government also will be quite telling. Maybe just very minor remark. Um, I think that the government is already trying to indeed uh, co-opt uh, some of their working collectivities. Yeah, we've seen uh, today that uh, some the peaceful protests in some towns uh, have ceased, and uh, the government it, uh, will co-opt and depoliticize them by bureaucratizing them through the so-called commissions. And of course, the outcomes of these commissions will probably take uh, 100 years to be, you know, and uh, this way simply the movement might die out. But at the same time, I think you know, Kazakh society will never be the same again as before. The memory, the bloodshed. Uh, the, uh, the experience of standing and confronting the power, that's what's going to really shape the Kazakh society. Despite the repressions, despite the cooptation, despite the cosmetic changes and reforms, the society will not be the same again. And this really gives hope that, uh, you know, um, that uh, people will not anymore so easily let the government to suppress them. And I think um, the, the Russian landing is, is also a, a little bit problematic. Um, there were... Uh, there was a, a beautiful study conducted by Marlene Daruel and Serik Besimbiev, um, looking at uh, the really the uh, pro-Russian and anti-Russian sentiments in Kazakhstan, and we see really a dramatic actually drop in those pro-Russian sentiments after 2014 Crimean annexation, right? So I, I, I think uh, uh, Tokayev will meet quite a huge resistance at home um, uh, if uh, the Russian troops decide to remain. Great. Great point, and that's got to be a, a part of his calculation. And to the to the question of memory and trauma, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. go back to the Jean Uzien events and mobilization in 2011, I mean, 
it's got to play a role in this next wave of in the mobilization uh, wave that we, we've just experienced, right? I mean, people have people have uh, have have memories, and and they know people who were uh, deeply affected by this, and now this is a national memory and a national trauma that can't help but have some kind of ongoing effect uh, going forward. Um, we're out of time, but I, if 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 the panelists are willing to stay for another five or six minutes, um, then I, I would love to wrap it up with a couple more questions. Is that okay? All right. Uh, sorry, I said maybe you do need a cup of coffee. I would offer you. It's late in Bishkek. Um, I did want to get to the question of um, this. Uh, let's call it this discourse of foreign uh, foreign terrorists um, uh, or foreign actors. And there was a question in the chat specifically about Islamists. Did they play any kind of role here? And you know, again, we're, we 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 quickly shift to the realm of speculation. I, I realize that, but is there? Is, what, what sense do we want to make of this language of foreign terrorists? Is, is it possible that I, on the surface, it seems like it would, might just be something that uh, one would do in order to sort of cleanse the Kazakh um, population of any culpability, right? If it was all foreigners who were responsible, then we can begin to reconcile and go forward, which is a, a nice thing that, that, uh, that people do, even if it's not factually correct. Um, but could it be true that there was an element of, you know, of, of foreign involvement? Um, and separately, um, could it be true that there was some element of Islamist involvement? Or, or if not, why not? Why don't, why don't, why didn't we see um, those who have some kind of agenda based on uh, on some interpretation of their religious values entering into the scene? Or did they? Any 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 sense on this stuff? Realizing we're sort of in the realm of speculation. Do you want to uh, do you want to start, um, Asad Dolot Oh, uh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I was trying to answer the questions in the Q and A session. And uh... oh. okay, okay, no, 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 no problem. Who wants to Who wants to take a stab at any of this? Well, I think it's very easy um, uh, to to basically um, create a kind of Islamist threat, uh, particularly because uh, it's it's a framework that works. Uh, for everyone, it's very much understandable. Um, uh, but it, it and it's also easy to find uh, people that may actually be religious. Uh, particularly, most of the people who ca came out on the um, on the streets, uh, they, they were people who you know who were living in rural areas, and and usually they are much more religious. They are much more pure, uh, pious. So we can we can they they may some of them may grow beards. Um, so so there is a possibility that yes, many of them were there. And if you think about how, for example, the protest in 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 Western Kazakhstan finished, right at the end, all the protesters come together and they have bata, right? So they they pray and <laughs> they go home. So it's it's a it's a, it's a very um, it's easy, in other words, uh, to make uh, an Islamist threat. Um, so we don't necessarily know if uh, what kind of groups uh, were among the, the people who were creating violence. I just don't really think that uh, Islamist, um, um, you know, that many of them, 20,000, came out and, and somehow engaged a, a, in violence, even if they, they have the Salafist uh, um, Salafist understanding and go against the state. Uh, I mean, that's still kind of very difficult um, uh, to, to hear. Uh, I mean, to, to, to basically piece out. Um, in terms of foreignness, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I would agree with the fact that uh, at present, the way uh, regime pieces its narrative uh, actually fits what Ed said. Uh, that simply we want to clean and say that all oh, Kazakh people were not like this. It's all the other elements, so to say. Um, so, so it's very easy then to create a kind of a unity. And, and the regime's uh, slogan is actually, we are all together. Um, uh, so, so that also means that they are trying to establish a kind of a, a narrative of the nation that doesn't really engage in that type of looting, uh, of violence and so on. Um, and that somehow it's it's all the other elements that are that are doing that, especially foreign trade. Um, I think the the better question would be where exactly these uh, bandits came from and how exactly they knew uh, which particular um, uh, establishment to to control and which of them to take and where exactly were the weapons. Um, I, I think um, again the the. Uh, 
my my sources basically say that uh, these were regular Kazakh guys, young. Uh, and uh, so what exactly were they doing? Who were they controlled by? Um, and uh, why they specifically decided to, to take up, for example, airport and burn uh, uh, certain buildings, government buildings and not others, certain stores and not others. I mean, that's very, that's, that's there, there are again, here are many questions. And uh, so we, that pushes me to think that uh, indeed it's, it was an internal rather than an external <laughs> threat in, in these events that thwarted the, yeah. the protest. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds that sounds compelling. Um, Darman or Asad? Yeah, just a short input. Uh, I think there might be also the legal aspect into this like external uh, fighters narrative because uh, like to enforce the collective security treaty, uh, it's necessary, I think, uh, to send peacekeepers precisely, it's necessary to have this external threat there. So I think that might be one of the reasons why they're using this narrative. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Um, the Collective Security Treaty Organization has a pretty loosely worded charter, so it could probably be interpreted, but this makes it easier to it to it interpret uh, to interpret it in its narrow uh, in its narrow sense. I said, yeah, well, um, of course, um, I'm not surprised that uh, this uh, terrorist, supposedly terrorist, should be necessarily Kyrgyz, right? There's this. <laughs> Yeah, well, there is this construction of the untouchable caste of uh, weaker and poorer states within the smaller region of Central Asia that has been created for years now. Basically, Kyrgyzstan is a is a by definition par excellence uh, a perfect state to always finger point is a hotbed of uh, whatever, all sorts of extremisms, because we've been rebellious three times. We had a horrible interethnic. Um, uh, pogroms in southern Tan. Uh, we have uh, religious freedoms and lots of uh, missionaries in Kyrgyzstan. So, by definition, it's the best place to point as a, you know a hotbed for all sorts of extremisms. So, but it's a really a dangerous tendency because uh, there is this uh, the Central Asian region, even without uh, naming the countries, um, is already facing so many obstacles to integration, to um, some sort of solidarity, and um, uh, finding the scapegoats um, doesn't help that uh, at all. No, no, it certainly certainly doesn't, whether it's individuals. I mean, it, it looks fairly ham-fisted to us, in at least those of us who are monitoring this from afar, when you see this uh, accomplished Kyrgyz jazz musician caught up in this silly charade. Uh, but it's uh, it's not clear that how it plays itself out with us um, is the same as how it would play itself out on the ground. And so that is um, absolutely something to to be both concerned about and paying attention to. Um, that's, a, that's a terrific point. The last question I wanna ask is something that uh, Darman brought up, which is about justice. Um, and uh, you, you'll forgive me if I end up sounding way too, too cynical and depressing on this, but um, what I've seen are some unsubstantiated reports of you know security people going door to door, um, looking for incriminating video evidence and eliminating either individuals, right? So this is where we get the, the recent deaths of uh, the, the highly placed security officials, uh, or who knows what they're who knows what they're up to. But it it doesn't seem like justice in the in the sense that we would use that term uh, in other kinds of contexts. If it is sort of vigilante kind of justice done by uh, state actors, and so um, what would we need to see in order to take a few steps in the direction of, of justice, um, actual justice. I mean, do, does Kazakhstan have a, um, a generation of well-trained lawyers who are not deeply implicated in a, in a corrupt justice system, for example, who could be, uh, whose, whose talents could be tapped into in order to, to hold, you know, so, at least some people to account to establish some semblance of justice going forward? Or is that not, uh, is that not in the cards? Um, I think I can start. I think the, the important part here is the fact that uh, the emergency situation enables these officials to basically collect um, enough evidence while this particular situation is in place. Um, and therefore, we cannot really control it uh, because uh, they literally have the legal uh, right and the order to collect evidence in whatever the way they want, including torture. 
um, including door to door and finding whoever, uh, picking up people who simply went to the mosque on Friday uh, and unfortunately carried a, a, so to say, wrong passport. And I, I simply want to apologize to uh, literally to all the Kyrgyz colleagues and the population that it's also hard, literally hard wrecking what the, the government narrative is doing um, to the relationship. I think it's, uh, yeah, and to all of my friends in Kyrgyzstan as well, I think this is not supposed to be like this at all. In terms of the justice served, I think what uh, what's possible to do is after, um, when the, the situation goes um, more or less, and that's how the legal system in Kazakhstan works, is that you basically, you get uh, wrapped up into something and then you hire a lawyer and then you basically then find ways of getting specific people out of the system. Uh, again, by, by hiring people who can potentially uh, show the violations um, in the procedure, uh, and so then you get them out. Uh, and so that's that's very normal uh, to get uh, parole, to get uh, all kinds of other things. But if you got tangled up into that, um, unfortunately, um, you just have to wait until the, the time comes and then you can hire the people, certain people who can then let you out. Um, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Asad or no, Darman? Yeah, just a quick remark. Um, my answer would be that, you know, there is definitely, there is no lack of competitive people who can, you know, do the justice. But the question is, will there be a political will? So I'm, I'm pretty sure there is enough com competent people, not only in the private sector, but even within the government. But they just weren't able to kind of use their skills and they were uh, brought up on, to the necessary levels of you know responsibility and positions to do that so i think that would be my answer well thanks thanks to everybody uh very difficult and um uh, difficult moment for for everybody particularly for people who are directly affected by it um, or who have relatives um, who are you are still uh, back home in Kazakhstan or in the region more broadly. I want to thank our three speakers, uh, especially for taking the time late at night. I said, um, sleep well, um, and also to uh, to Luke and Way down the street. Thanks for for joining us. Thanks to the audience members. I apologize if I didn't get to your to your question, but uh, the discussion was so rich and our time was so short that we didn't uh, have time for everything. But thanks, thanks everybody. Take care. <laughs>